Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. Today we're continuing our message series entitled, Show Me the Way. Our message today is called, Part 2, Salt to Self. In our last message, we learned that we're the salt of the earth, which means we're to be salt to the body of Christ, the blood bought, the saints, the redeemed, the believers, us Christians. Being salt means to be fertilizer. It means to be a disinfectant. Fertilizer means we're to teach, we're to encourage, while disinfect means to correct and to admonish the body of Christ, the saints, the Christians. But not only are we to be the salt to the body of Christ, but we, we are to be salt to our own selves. We, we must be salt in our own lives as well. Being salt includes being salt to self, meaning we are to be salt through self-evaluation. We're to evaluate our thoughts, our actions. We're to evaluate our words and make sure that whatever we do, whatever we think, whatever we say, all lines up with the Word of God. It lines up with Scripture. Turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 50. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their warm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves. Be at peace with one another. These are very, very strong words. This is a very hard teaching that we just kind of brush over whenever we read it. But I want you to listen closely to what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 47. And if your hand causes you to sin, he said, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. This is self-disinfectant. Being salt is not just for others, but for yourself as well. You must take a self-inventory and evaluate yourself. You can't take for granted that you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and there's nothing else for you to do. Everything is finished. Everything is done. There's nothing more for you to do but to sit down and wait. No. This admonishment is a warning it is directed towards Christians. It's not directed towards the world. It's directed to us. It's us that, is, that Jesus is talking to. If you, Jesus is saying, if you, my servants, find that your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Even if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Do not let any of them cause you to be thrown into the unquenchable fires of hell. It would be better for you to enter life, eternal life, maimed or crippled or even with one eye or even blind than to have the alternative, the unquenchable flames of hell. We used to sing a hymn that, that goes like this. I don't want nothing here to hinder me. For some day, his blessed face I long to see. It makes no difference what the cost or how heavy my cross. I don't want 
nothing here to hinder me. That should be our life song. It should be the anthem of our hearts. Because the last chorus, at least the way we used to sing it, it, it says it all. This is what it's, how we used to sing it. You'll be so glad nothing here did hinder you. When you hear, my child, you made it through. It makes no difference what the cost or how heavy your cross. You'll be so glad nothing here did hinder you. That is what we're all striving for, at least us Christians. That, what, that is what we're striving for. So why let temporal things get in our way? Why let, get, let temporal things distract us from the real prize? Nothing here is worth over there. But nothing, nothing can even compare to the things that God has, come, has in store for us. We are our brother's keeper, sure. But we must also keep watch over our own souls. In other words, we do not participate in the things of this world. They're passing away. We don't get caught up in those things. Yes, we live in this world. Therefore, there are things that we have no choice but to participate in, such as voting. But we vote according to Scripture. We don't vote for things that are blatantly against God. We need to get back to the basics where righteousness is the rule of thumb and holiness is the way of life. We need to get back to where our main objective is to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we need to be our brother's keeper. We need to look up for each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to help each other stay on a straight and narrow. See, without this, we are saltless salt we're a salt with no saltiness to it but see the thing about saltless salt is when we become saltless salt we are of no use to jesus in his kingdom all's left for us to be thrown out and trampled underfoot see without action our faith is dead we are to work out our salvation with much fear and trembling. But what does that look like, Brother Kenny? Well, for one, we are always self-disinfected. We are always self-evaluated. We are disinfecting other people as well, other believers, our brothers, our sisters, and they, us. And we are always spread in the light. But we're going to talk about being the light in our next message. But before we can start correcting our brothers and our sisters, we must first self-correct. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, first you take the log out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye, out of your sister's eye. But you got to do some self-evaluation. You just can't live your life anyhow, doing anything, doing what pleases you and pleases your flesh, and then expect to correct somebody else. It doesn't work that way. This is what Paul told the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He said, present your bodies as living, sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It is your spiritual worship. In other words, it is the least that is expected of you. The very very least. Understand that 
We were once cut off from the Father, signified by that curtain that separated the holy from the most holy. You see, the temple, Solomon's temple, was built and it was divided into three parts. The outer court, the inner court, and the holiest place, or the holy of holies. See, the holiest place was where the very presence of God abided. It rested over the mercy seat. And no one was allowed to enter except for the high priest. And he only once a year. And not without the blood of goats and lambs and bulls. To ensure that no one entered this holiest place. It was separated by a very, very thick curtain. But when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. He opened up the way for us to enter the very presence of the Father. This is what the, the writer of the book of Hebrews said. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet each other as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So now Jesus is our high priest whose blood we, we have by whose blood we can now enter into the presence of Almighty God. The writer is encouraging us to continue in purity, to continue in holiness by our belief and our acceptance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and Him saving us and through water baptism. We no longer continue in our old way of life. We leave those old things behind us and we press on to that which is before us. And we hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. How? By being sought to disinfect our lives through self-evaluation. Then he encourages us to be sought to others by stirring up one another to love and good works. We do not live to ourselves alone, but we are to look out for each other. We're to look out for others. We're to encourage others, and we're to look out for their best interests. But first, we have to make sure that things are right in our own lives first. Then we can help others. I want you to see something. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is not just speaking about others, but it is talking to us as well. It's for our own self-evaluation as well. First, he says that all scripture is breathed out by God, meaning that scripture is beyond dispute. It is without error, and it is 100% trustworthy. Why? Because it is God-breathed. So we are not indecisive on using scripture. We're not intimidated with using scripture. Neither are we unsure as to its accuracy because it is God breathed. Scripture is our first and our last reference. Therefore, we are confident to use scripture to teach, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now I want you to watch this. Why? so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That 
is why, why we do what we do. That's why we teach. That's why we correct. That's why we train so that the man and the woman of God is equipped for every good work. You see, it is scripture that we use to do all of this. Not some other want to be, but scripture and scripture alone. Everything we do, every offering we make must be seasoned with salt. Look at Leviticus chapter 2 verse 13. You shall season all your green offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of a covenant with your God be missing from your green offering. With all your offering, you shall offer salt. Now compare this with what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. This is the reason why we must be salt to ourselves. Because the day is coming when everyone, the good, the bad, the ugly, will be tested with fire. The believer as well as the unbeliever. The saved as well as the unsaved. The saint as well as the sinner. We will all stand before God's judgment soon. No one will be missed out. No one will be overlooked. Everyone will stand before the throne of God. Everybody's work will be tested by fire. If it is burned up, he or she will suffer loss, Paul said. The good news, though, is that he or she will be saved, but only through the fire. Everything you work for will be burnt up. So you got to watch what you do and how you do it. You got to watch your attitude. See, that's why we do not forget to be salt to self. But consider and judge everything that we do, everything that we say. We judge it. We make sure that it lines up with the Word of God, that God breathed Scripture. As I mentioned earlier, we are of no use in the kingdom of God if we become saltless salt. Everything we do, everything we offer must be seasoned with salt. Even with the incense, there had to be salt. Look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 34 through 37. The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stat, and anica, and galbanum, sweet spices, and pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it, very small, and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of Medan, where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you, and the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. It all comes back to what we have done. We won't be judged on what we say we have done but on what we have actually done. There are a lot of really rich, wealthy individuals claiming to be some philanthropists. By the dictionary's definition of a philanthropy, it means a desire to help mankind, especially as shown in gifts to charitable or humanitarian institutions. The majority of those who claim to be philanthropists neither have the desire nor the will to help mankind. Here's how you can tell. How many water wells have you dug, sir? How many tons of food have you donated to the hungry? How many houses have you built for the homeless? How many naked have you clothed? Pumping them full of vaccines is not philanthropy. It is population control. And I apologize, you two. That wasn't me. It was Bill Gates who said that. So please don't put us in 
time out again. Thank you in advance. So, look, I better wrap this all up before I get in too much trouble. I want you to realize this, though, that we are the salt of the earth, meaning we are called to be our brother's keeper to the body of Christ. We're called to be our brother's keeper to the church. And as the salt of the earth, we have to keep disinfecting our own selves first. Then we are free to disinfect others as well. Jesus has called us to live in peace and harmony with each other. But he has also expects us to correct each other. Whenever one of us goes straight, the other helps get them back on the right track again. The things people believe in today that they they cannot back up with scripture. They they cannot even tell you where it's found in scripture. It's amazing how how they stick to these teachings that they have no clue where they come from. And they will argue right into the ground without one verse, one shred of evidence. Once, not even a verse to back up or to prove their theory or somebody else's theory that they have adopted. The bottom line is this. Jesus is coming back really soon. He will judge the quick and the dead. In other words, Jesus is coming back to judge every single soul, whether alive or whether dead. From the beginning of time, from Adam, all the way down to his return. Each one will stand before the white throne judgment. If you believe in a lie, you will perish. Believe only what is in scripture. If you can't defend it by scripture without taking scripture out of context or adding to it, do not believe it. Eternity is a long, long time. You want you want to spend eternity with Jesus in blissfulness. You don't want to spend eternity in a lake of fire where the flames are never quenched. Eternity never ends. I'm not asking you to believe me just because I said it. I want you to go to the scriptures. I always encourage you, get a Bible, read the Bible. You've got to make sure what you're being told is accurate. So go to the scriptures and see for yourself if I'm right or if I'm wrong or if that preacher or that televangelist or that whoever who tells you something is right or wrong. They have to back it up by scripture and scripture alone. So let me ask you, are you ready for Jesus' return? Are you ready to stand in the judgment? If not, you can be. Here's how. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me. And Jesus will hear. He will see the sincerity of your heart. And he will accept that. He will accept you as his child. If you ask for forgiveness of your sins. Let, let me lead you in a simple prayer of repentance. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord. Help me to learn truth. Help me to stick to the truth. Open my eyes to lies. Open my eyes to truth. Help me to believe in truth. I accept you, Lord Jesus as my Savior. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your free gift of life. Thank you, Jesus. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Find a Bible believe in church that believes everything that's in that Bible. Still believes in the power of the saving grace, the power of the Holy Spirit, the love 
the forgiveness of Almighty God. Believes in holiness, believes in righteousness. Join that church, be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that is what we're all striving to, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. May the Lord bless you richly. Jesus loves you, we love you. I'm Kenny Yates, this is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.